Um, I'm going to ask that if you want to make a comment, please send the chat message only to me, just so it doesn't interrupt the flow and everyone doesn't get the pop up on their screen. It's it's very helpful if you send it only to me, and then we could go over all the questions later. Um, here is Dr. Bill Thierfelder, a professor of arts and humanities, also a docent at the American Museum of Natural History. And we are happy to have you today. It's um, science fiction writers, five women. I'm excited. <laughs> okay, very good. Well, thank you very much. And uh, welcome to Changing Our Perspectives, Five Women. Um, as you just heard, my name is uh, Dr. Bill Thierfelder and I will be your host today. Now, for those who don't know me, I'm a retired professor, as you were just told, of arts and humanities. I currently live out here in Portland, Oregon, and um, where we're having a lovely day. I understand you guys had snow this week. Uh, we didn't. <laughs> um, I live in Portland. I'm a lecturer, a writer, an artist there, but I also, as you heard, return regularly to my hometown of New York City to continue my work as a docent, a fossil explainer, and a special projects editor at the American Museum of Natural History. Now, today we'll be looking at five women whose books have influenced millions. And they each chose or have chosen speculative fiction as a means to help us see ourselves, others, and the world around us in new ways. In other words, they have helped us and continue to help us change our perspectives and um, our perceptions. And um, let me just go here. They are in alphabetical order, uh, Margaret Atwood, uh, Octavia Butler, N.K. Jemison, Ursula Le Guin, and we're going to go back a little bit, Mary Shelley. Now, each of these women, uh, as we shall hear, made lasting contributions in many ways, not only as important literary figures, but as creative women in an often predominantly male-dominated field. And at least two of the women, Octavia Butler and uh, Mary Shelley, also explored their sexuality, either in writing or in public. So uh, once again, for those of you who are familiar with my programs, since we can't cover everything in one presentation, I invite you to take a deeper dive on my website, makingwings.net. And we're going to take Deeper Dive 33. Now, what do I mean by that? So if you go to makingwings, it's one word, .net, you are going to come to a home page. Looks like this. I like to say with me, myself, and I. And if you go into the upper right corner, there is what is called a hamburger menu. And if you click on that, you're going to have a menu of different things. You can even read my resume if you want. You can see some of my artwork. You can read some of my writing. Um, but there are these deeper dives. For every presentation that I give, I create a page on my website. And so today's is number 33. So you click on the chevron, not on the name, but on the chevron next to it. And there you are, Changing Perspectives, Five Women. And there you are. And you will be brought to this page. And you will be getting not only biographical sketches. Don't want to make you too dizzy here. But a little further down the page, after you look at the biographies, some uh, recommended books. We'll be talking about those. But then I find these the most helpful, I think, for people who like to visit. I have both printed web resources as well as video web resources. So I think uh, and all of those web resources are found on YouTube. So a lot of cool stuff there. Um, and uh, I just hope you take advantage of it. All righty, let's go back here. Okay, 
So what I would like to do today, with the obvious exception of Mary Shelley, is to let you hear each of our five authors speak for themselves. And then after we hear from or about, in the case of Shelley, these authors, we'll take a brief look at one representative book from each. Now, they obviously have written many, many other books. I've chosen one for each because I think they're representative. So we're going to begin, and again, so we're showing no prejudice here, alphabetical order. And so we start with the A's and we start with Margaret Atwood. Um, this is a 2016 video interview. It's about nine minutes long. Um, she is, of course, an award-winning Canadian novelist, poet, and short story writer who was born in Ottawa, Canada in 1939. Um, <clears throat> at the age of 83, she is still going strong, uh, very strong, having uh, published an exceptional collection of poetry in 2020 called Dearly. Uh, and a delicious short story published as an ebook titled My Evil Mother uh, in 2022. Now, because this interview occurred in 2016, it obviously doesn't refer to the award winning adaptation of her novel, The Handmaid's Tale, on Hulu, nor uh, The Handmaid's brilliant sequel called The Testaments, no, and also doesn't make reference to the book of poetry dearly. But it does really give you a flavor of Atwood as a person and as a thinker. Now, again, you may have to adjust the sound on your devices. Uh, and the closed captioning, I'll put up closed captioning, but it's very typical of YouTube. Sometimes it's great, and sometimes it's really miserable. The misspellings of words is, wow. <laughs> um, but the captioning seems to stop about halfway through. So adjust your sound and off we go. Uh, Margaret Atwood. Not everybody's gonna like your work. And if they do, you're doing something wrong. I'm Lauren Euler, and this is Broadly Meets. Today, I'm in New York City talking with Canadian author Margaret Atwood. Margaret Atwood is an award-winning author of more than 40 books of fiction, poetry, and critical essays. Her work has been published in 35 countries and across several genres. Known in her early career for pushing conventional boundaries in both her politics and her prose style, Atwood is constantly examining contemporary culture and discussing women's rights. Margaret Atwood continues to remain on the forefront of the literary world. She's always exploring new ways of storytelling, especially when it comes to the surreal or the speculative. Her newest and 15th novel, The Heart Goes Last, was published in the fall of 2015. We recently sat down with the author to talk about her extensive career and some of the themes she has returned to throughout her work. What's your daily routine? Get up in the morning, drink some blood, <laughs> Go on. It's like everybody's work process. I get up, I have breakfast, I work. Mm -hmm. A lot of your books deal with a sort of near future and they're very speculative. People will often say things like, oh, this happened in Oryx and Craig by Margaret Atwood. Oh, this is just like The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood, which was written in 1985. And now it's really happening. Did you Doesn't anticipate? That creep you out? It does. Um, yeah. Did you well, anticipate that? No. You don't write those books because you hope those things will happen. You write those books because you think they might happen, um, but you would rather they didn't. Atwood's first novel, *The Edible Woman*, published in 1969, explored several controversial issues of the time, including gender, the constraints of domestic life, and reproductive rights. Sixteen years later, her book The Handmaid's Tale, which was then made into a film starring Natasha Richardson and Faye Dunaway, examined questions about women's rights and sexuality even further. Although The Handmaid's Tale was written over 30 years ago, it feels eerily relevant in the context of today's debates about Planned Parenthood and abortion rights. How do you see women's rights right now? People have to decide what kind of world they want to live in. Mm -hmm. Are we in favor of, of forced childbirth? because that's the world that we're going to get if we shut down reproductive rights. 
right to life is one way of putting it, forced to childbirth is, is another way. I don't, it just doesn't seem like that's a good idea or going to happen. <laughs> it does seem to be that every totalitarian government on the planet has always taken a very great interest in, in uh, women's reproductive rights. Do you think I need to be worried about it as a member of the young no, generation? No, because you, you live in New York. Sure. So in Handmaid's Tale, New York is a, is a holdout. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say they live in Texas. It would be nice for them to get a train ticket. <laughs> What do you think about, say, porn, which historically has been about presenting women for men? The real attraction of porn is that that person can't say no. Right. So I will never be rejected. Nobody will laugh at me. So the men will not have self-esteem destroying experiences if they're interacting with unreal sexual objects. Do you think that's appealing for women as well? Well, that's why they read romance novels. Okay. Because they know that that romance will turn out well in the end. Mm -hmm. And it was even the appeal of however many shades of gray that was. The Cinderella story with porn. <laughs> so princess, Prince Charming is a fetishist. <laughs> sure, yeah. I guess what I'm more wondering is if you think it's harmful or it does more harm than good. It's harmful if people think it's the real world and start acting that way. Sure. But if you think that there weren't lots of pictures of girls without very many clothes on pretty much throughout history, you'd be wrong about that too. <laughs> yeah. And the good side of that is, if men were not interested in uh, women without very many clothes on, there probably wouldn't be a human race. Can you talk a little bit about the process of writing The Heart Goes Last? So this was something that began as a serial on the internet at which point the hero was disguised as an Elvis Presley sex robot and was being shipped to Las Vegas in a crate. Yeah. And so that, that was where it ended online. And around this time, my book publishers had caught wind of it mm -hmm. and were saying, basically, Margaret, what are you doing, you naughty girl? This should be a book with covers and pages. But you're someone who wouldn't necessarily have to publish online, right? Yeah, I know, but yeah. I'm curious. A number of the different inventions that have come along on the internet I've tried out. Sure. Having a blog is a lot of work, mm -hmm. and Twitter is very short and useful for promoting other people's work. There's always the hope that Margaret Atwood will retweet you because you do... Is that the hope? I God, think, I mean, in trouble you, if do, that's the hope. you do retweet people do, who yes. ask you. Yes, I do. Depends what they're asking. Some people have done quite quite well by having me tweet their thing. Mm -hmm. And That's they were young and unknown, so you never know when, when the blue fairy will descend <laughs> and touch you with the magic wand. Sure. I think you've retweeted <laughs> me once. And was that fun? It was fun. It was very exciting. I put you on a top ten list. <laughs> <laughs> do people ever troll you oh, or yeah. harass you? Oh, yeah. I don't like people yelling at one another mm -hmm. uh, on my feed. It's politeness rules. Sure. I don't mean you have to use super squeaky clean language. I mean, you can't do hate speech and stuff like that on my feed. I don't permit it. Sure. Do you read reviews or do you see people talking about your work on Twitter or on Goodreads or Amazon? Well, I'm not very obsessed with that. Yeah. Uh, writers complain about bad reviews, but they also complain about no reviews. The thing about reviews always is, for, for any writer, read them later. But you read them eventually? I wouldn't say every one. Right. Because not everybody's going to like your work, and if they do, you're doing something wrong. I think though a lot of people would say that the internet and Twitter and Facebook and liking have created a culture where people are more desperate to be liked or yeah, and I think that's unfortunate. What the internet has done is it's, it's, it's enabled people to objectify their internal checklists and evaluate people according to them. I think it's pretty hilarious from a certain standpoint that people lie about themselves. You know, they lie about how tall they are, they lie about how much money they've got. They, they do quite a lot of lying when they're presenting themselves, but they always have. <laughs> <laughs> true, <laughs> I guess really, that's true. They always have done a certain amount of lying. Mm -hmm. 
you've talked a lot about how you don't want to be labeled an icon or put on a pedestal because it's limiting and constricting. I'm wondering if that's not inevitable. Well, you once I'm dead, it's going to be inevitable. <laughs> <laughs> sure. It won't last. You know, but do you not think don't. that you're an icon now, inevitably, anyway? So you don't really get to be that in quite the same way when you're 20. For good reason. Well, you get to be a different kind of thing. Okay, what do you get if to be? If you're a pop star, you know, or something like that, you get to be a kind of Madonna, Beatle, or Lady Gaga. What is the last female pop artist you've listened to or enjoyed? Well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm keen on Lady Gaga because of the outfits. It's not even so much what she sings, it's how she gets herself up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. But if I started doing those things at my age, people would think that was pretty strange. If I got myself carried in in an egg, which I thought was pretty good. I think that if <laughs> Margaret Atwood came into the Let interview in an that egg... It, a, it would have a somewhat different effect. Sure. Yeah. But I think it would be po positive. But well, it would be, it I think would be it wacky. would be very weird. <laughs> <laughs> it would be wacky instead of In a of, different like, way. Glamorous. A different way from when she did it. <laughs> sure. Thank you for talking to me. It was great. Thank you. At its worst, I think Twitter seems like a gossipy high school oh, I cafeteria. Think at it, yeah, at its worst, it's very bad. Mm -hmm. uh, but everything at its worst is very bad. <laughs> think of it that way. Sure. So take the best, ignore the worst, and try to anticipate the unknown unknown, and then you'll be okay. Great little interview there. Let me go back to our page here. So as you can see, Atwood uh, is never shy about expressing her opinions. And I have included this interview and every one of the others that you're gonna be watching today on my website, if you'd like to hear more or extended versions or whatever. And uh, in this case, I have this interview up there. Now for each of the writers that we are looking at today, I've chosen one representative book. Now, while The Handmaid's Tale would certainly be a great choice, as would its spectacular sequel, The Testaments, which came out in 2019, I'm uh, going for a novel that looks at the world before and after an apocalyptic pandemic. Sound familiar? Um, it's called Oryx and Crake and is the first installment of a remarkable trilogy uh, which includes After the Flood and Mad Adam. Now, this perception-changing novel, first published in 2003, is one of my favorites by Atwood. I taught it several times in my literature classes at Dowling College in New York, and my students truly resonated with the story. And what is that story? Well, it tells... Um, the story in flashbacks of a young man named Jimmy, who lives in the not-too-distant future where mega corporations have completely taken control of the planet. The unbridled biological experiments of some of these companies, uh, companies with names like Rejuvenescence and uh, New You, uh, create an increasingly nightmarish world which includes hybrid animals uh, like the ferocious wolvogs and the cattle-sized pigoons uh, that are used to harvest organs for human transplants. Now, one of Jimmy's school friends, Glenn, uh, who starts to call himself Crake, uh, is uh, the head of one of these corporations. And over time, he becomes a sociopathic, power-hungry uh, scientist who uh, creates wild things, including a sex drug called Bliss Plus. Now, in the novel, he sends his lover, Oryx, uh, who is a former porn star, he sends her around the globe to help promote Bliss Plus. But during this same time, Jimmy, who has come to work for Crake and his company, also becomes sexually involved with Oryx, which, needless to say, becomes very messy emotionally. A little menage a trois there, right? Now, unbeknownst to Oryx, 
the girl or Jimmy, Crake has spiked Bliss Plus uh, with a deadly virus. And over a relatively short time, the entire population of the world dwindles to near nothing. Meanwhile, Crake's hybrid childlike humanoids, whom he has nicknamed the Crakers, uh, begin to thrive in a facility called, I love it, Paradise. <laughs> Obviously, instead of paradise, it's a, it's a crap roll, right? It's a paradise. Now, much of the novel takes place after this apocalyptic pandemic, when Jimmy has renamed himself Snowman. He's one of the last humans left, and he becomes the de facto leader of a group called the Crakers. The novel is narrated by Snowman, both as Snowman and flashbacks as Jimmy, and recounts how he tries to survive. And again, it uses flashbacks to a time when he was Jimmy to tell how the world got to where it is today. Now, I really don't want to say any more than that because there are all kinds of twists and turns. Uh, each character is wonderfully drawn and the plot which eventually turns into a detective story, at what is great at detective stories, um, is more relevant uh, than ever. Um, if you've ever read her novel, The Blind Assassin, you know how good she is at detective writing. Perhaps most importantly, just like Jonathan Swift and H.G. Wells did, Atwood uses fantasy and what if possibilities to make pointed commentaries uh, about science, technology, politics, pornography, religion, and other social topics. And, and you certainly heard uh, a number of those topics in that little interview uh, we just watched. For, uh, for me, Oryx and Crake is best read as a prophetic novel. As Atwood said in the interview we just saw, she's presenting a world that she doesn't want to see unfold. But her novel is a prophet's warning, a voice crying out in the wilderness. And I think she's hoping she is not ignored like Cassandra was. Now, we're not going to spend now nine minutes with the late great speculative fiction writer Octavia Butler. Uh, she was born in California, Pasadena, uh, in 1947. And Butler, a Black woman, and a very private and often introverted lesbian writer stood out in a field dominated by white men, but her talent as a consummate writer made her famous. Now, contrary to the genre's tendency towards fantasy and escapism, Butler used science fiction as a way to examine issues facing humanity. In her novels, uh, she explored the historical exploitation of minorities and the creation of alternative communities. In 1999, Butler abandoned California for Seattle, Washington, where she began to struggle with writer's block and ill health. And she passed away far too early from a stroke and a serious fall at her Seattle home in 2006 at the young age of 56. Now, what you're going to see now is part of an interview that she gave in the year 2000 on the Charlie Rose Show. Uh, this was shortly after she had moved to Seattle. Um, you may remember the Charlie Rose Show on PBS, 11 o'clock every night. I was a faithful watch watcher. Perhaps some of you were too. Uh, Rose is, of course, we remember, a very thoughtful interviewer but you have to get used to his constant interruptions. He tended to interrupt his interviewees, but Butler handles it wonderfully. And we truly get to see what a remarkable person she is. And once again, um, you can, you're gonna definitely have to adjust the sound on your devices because this is an old analog recording. So the, the, the sound is not that great. Um, and once again, the closed captioning has the typical YouTube misspellings, but uh, I wanted you to see this because I thought this was one of the better uh, interviews that you 
have. So here she goes. Growing up as a poor, painfully shy child, author Octavia Butler found a refuge in the limitless world of science fiction. She began writing her own stories at 10. At 13, she began sending her work out to be published. For decades and over a dozen novels later, she has established herself as one of the most respected science fiction writers working today. Her work draws praise and distinction for its exploration of feminist and racial themes. In 1995, she became the recipient of the MacArthur Genius Grant her most recent book, Parables of the Talents, is currently nominated for the Nebula Award for Best Novel. I am pleased to have her here on this program at long last. Welcome. Thank you said you. it's good that I brought both of them together because? Well, together they are the autobiography of a fictional character who creates a new religion and sets humanity's feet on a different path. Yeah. Singly, I'm not sure that comes across. Um, why science fiction? Because there are no closed doors, no walls. I mean, the only rule is if you use science, you should use it accurately. Um, you can look at, examine, play with anything, absolutely anything. Are you surprised that you became a writer? Oh, no. No, I, I think I had one choice, well, two choices. I could become a writer. Or I could die really young, yeah, that because be there wasn't anything else that I wanted. So I mean, you, I, I you could not have been a writer. You would have said to the gods, "Take me now," because I, I have well, no I reason to exist. I probably would have done something stupid, and that's what would have happened. <laughs> it's what just, was it's it about so writing for you? Oh, you got to make your own worlds. You got to write yourself in, <laughs> whether you were a part of the greater society or not. You got to write yourself in. So I got to write myself in. And you get to do it in, in, in the limited world, as you say, because there are no, there are no walls, there are no limits. Mm -hmm. Plus, you treat science, you treat subjects like race, sexual prejudice. Sure. All of that. Mm -hmm. You can put that in I a write context about people. that has all. I write about people and the different ways of being human. And you can't really do that unless you write about a lot of different kinds of people. Has it been difficult for you? It was horrible at first. Um, I have a book called Kindred. It was my fourth published yeah. book. And in Kindred, I, the, my character is a new writer. And she has lots of horrible little jobs, cleaning, warehouse, factory, uh, office, you name it, food processing. All jobs she, you knew. All jobs I'd done. <laughs> and um, I mean, some that I didn't even put in because they were just so bad. What's the best part of where you are now? Um, well, I don't have to worry about how to pay the mortgage. Yeah. Um, I get to write the stories that I want to write and, and, and not worry that maybe they won't be accepted because they already have been. I can recall my best friend telling me back when I was um, working on my first novel that I really should change some things because I was going to have the wrong attention drawn right. to them. and. Thank goodness I paid no attention. What's the day like now for you? Do you okay, still get well, up and listen to NPR and all that? I do. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I don't get up as early like as NPR. I once did. But oh, you I, don't? No, not. I used to, well, when I was um, working for other people, I would get up at 2. Yeah. And I would write until I had to go to work. And I would go to work grouchy because I was already tired. Yeah. And now I certainly don't have to do that. But... For, there was a while, there was a, a, an in-between time when I got up around 3 or 4, just because I liked the early morning hours before the light changed. And now I get up probably between 5.30 and 6. And I get to write most of the day, unless I have to go out and do something. Yeah. And um, I do that. Is it a joy for you? Oh, yeah. Just yeah. writing is a joy. Well, I get to read and write. You don't just sit there all day and, 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 and punch away. But the reading stimulates my thinking in so many directions yeah. that, um, it, yes, it's definitely a joy. What did the MacArthur Genius Grant do, other, um, other than money? First off, they don't call it that. <laughs> and if, if it really was that, they probably wouldn't have given it to me. But, what um, do they call it? Uh, MacArthur Fellowship. 
Fellowship. Yeah. Oh, they, they, oh the genius thing they don't say. They say fellowship. Mm hmm Yeah, somebody made that up. <laughs> Some newspaper. <laughs> yeah. Person. Um, I, um, I liked getting it. Of course I liked getting it. Stupid. Everybody would like to. Yeah, of it. course. But um, I especially liked two things. One, it gave me a chance to buy my first house. Yeah. I was going to do that anyway, but I, I couldn't have afforded one someplace where I would have been comfortable about living. I mean, I had been already been burglarized several times in in the, the the rented digs that I was in, so I didn't really want to buy a house and have that happen over and over again. Um, the other thing was. All of a sudden, people who had not taken, not, not paid any attention to my work because it was just that science yeah. fiction garbage, right. began to pay attention to it, and that means a great deal. Yeah. Are you cr trying to create a new black mythology? No. You know, no. If someone read. No, I'm I telling, wrote, I read I'm somebody, telling somebody stories wrote that, that interest me. Well, I mean, one of the things that happens to your work once it's out there is that people bring Try things to, to it. They try and to find it. Mm -hmm, sure. Not only that, but sometimes what's important to them gets all mixed up in it. And one of the things that I tell people who are reading my work critically is that what they bring to it is at least as important to them as what I put into it. And well, that's true. What then is central to what you want to say about race? Do I want to say something central about race aside from, hey, we're here? Yeah, right. That's right. And we're going to be here. Yeah. yeah. We are here. Mm -hmm. um, when I was just getting started, around 79, I guess it was, um, my books were just starting to do reasonably well. I was on a, um, a convention, right, a science fiction convention panel. And in order to start trouble, I think, I hope, the guy next to me, science fiction panels are, are known for, you know, start an argument and then you can, you know, mix it up and, and um, something interesting might happen. But um, the guy next to me was an editor and he said um, he thought that it wasn't really necessary um, to have black characters in science fiction because um, you could always say any racial, make any racial statement you needed to make by way of extraterrestrials. And... Um, if he was trying to start trouble, he certainly succeeded. <laughs> you took it as trouble, didn't you? Oh, or yeah. you made trouble. Well, I wound up writing, writing an article yeah. about it and about the idea of writing science fiction as though it were happening in your neighborhood. Can, it, can you say that you enjoy writing science fiction because, in fact, you like to read science fiction? That too, yes. Yes, I love reading it. Um, I don't love reading it as much as I once did. I find that now I love reading nonfiction oh. because it kind of turns into things. Um, I also, I listen, I, I, I learn better through listening than through reading, which is one of the reasons oh, I read so slowly. I hear every word, you know, and that way I can remember I it. Too. Uh, um, I get um, books on tape. Um, Unabridged, thank you very oh, much. Oh, yes. Oh, heavens yes. <laughs> and also um, courses on tape. The, the, the teaching company or something like that has courses. And I brought one with me because I knew I was coming here, and it's just four little tapes, you know. Oh, good and, for you. Um, so you're a little, bit of a, you're a little bit of a little self-improvement thing there, aren't you? No, I'm enjoying myself. Okay, I'm enjoying <laughs> I, I, I mean, I don't mind if I improve. Of course, think of improvement. I mean, I think of courses, but you're, you're saying oh, that. I, see. I know books is enjoyment. You could mm -hmm. say enjoyment, but you, you t teaching these courses you take are what? It's well, just I'm, about self-education. Well, it's about okay. You could yes, definitely. It, it yes, it's it's about um, sending my mind off someplace that it hasn't been before. Um, okay, now, let me just go back here. So. Let me explain why that cut off so abruptly. That was the first nine minutes of a nearly 20 minute interview. Uh, and I have both portions on the website. Now, you certainly get enough of it to be potentially annoyed with Charlie Rose and in love with Octavia Butler, uh, who comes off as a gentle, thought-filled and per uh, perceptive person. Um, uh, really great, great writer. Uh, by the way, it's the Nebula Award, not the Nebula Award. <laughs> well, what we never heard about uh, in this and other interviews is anything about her sexual orientation. 
Um, and there's a reason that I'm bringing this up. I, it will be it will become clear, I hope, in a couple of slides. You see, at the time of her death, her obituary said she was a lesbian, a fact confirmed by several of her close friends. Yet we know of no romantic relationships or outward expressions of her identity. She was intensely private. In Butler's 1991 interview with Larry McCaffrey and Jim McMenamin for the University of Mississippi Press, a Butler says the following about her sexuality. She said this, because of the way I look, six feet tall and stocky, um, I was called uh, various and sundry unsavory names by people who thought I was gay, though at the time nobody used that word. I eventually wondered if they might not be right, so I called the Gay and Lesbian Services Center and asked if they had meetings uh, where people could talk about such things. I wound up going down there twice, at which point I realized, nah, this isn't it. Um, I, I also realized once I thought it over uh, that I'm a hermit. Well, at any rate, Butler goes on to say, uh, I was intrigued by gay sexuality enough so that I wanted to play around uh, with it in my imagination and in my work. Uh, now, that's one of the things that I do in my writing. Either I find out certain things about myself or I write to create some context in which I can explore what I want to be. So instead of being uh, a lesbian, uh, Butler posits the word hermit as a self-description. And you, if you think back to that interview, you know, she says, you know, I get up at 536 and I write all day and I read all day. You know, you, you notice that there wasn't a lot about other people in that. You're very much a, a, a hermit. We might link this idea with perhaps asexuality or see it as reaching entirely beyond available categoric labels for sexuality. And this brings us to her writing where she finds the best place to explore identity sexual and otherwise, and she does that in most of her writing. Put simply, Butler's literary explorations demonstrate her curiosity about sexual expression and gender identity, even if she didn't necessarily do so in her real life. Well, meanwhile, back to the Charlie Rose interview, one of the things I take away is her very matter-of-fact way of approaching science fiction. It doesn't have to be about long ago and galaxies far, far away. It can be science-based uh, in the here and now, and it can explore real everyday issues. And in that regard, she's very much a sister to Margaret Atwood. Now, for me, Butler's 1979 novel, Kindred, which she mentions in her interview, is, for many readers, her most complete and fulfilling work. In it, she looks at slavery through the eyes of a modern protagonist. It's a deeply moving story of one woman's encounter with her past and the past of African-Americans in our country. Now, Kindred explores four main characters, two of whom, a black writer named Dana and her white husband, Kevin, travel back and forth in time between a slave plantation in Maryland in 1815 and their comfortable home in California in 1976. Now, for those of you who are familiar with uh, Diana Gabaldon's Outlander series, um, you'll, you'll see how much those books and the wonderful television adaptations, I might add, owe to a great, great debt to this novel, Kindred, uh, and other novels by Butler. When Dana, uh, is the main female character, is uh, 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 the modern day uh, character, uh, is in the antebellum South, she is forced to live as a slave in order to survive. There she encounters a red-headed boy named Rufus, who is very inconsistent, po power drunk slave owner, 
who turns out to be the father of a distant relative of Dana. So that's the connection. This is, you know, a great, 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 great uncle or aunt or not, not aunt, uh, grandfather or something way back in the past. Well, in 1815, Dana becomes close to the fourth main character of the novel. So we have we have Dana, we have the husband, Kevin, we have this guy, Rufus, the slave owner. And the fourth main character is a slave named Alice, who is forced to bear Rufus's children. Remember, uh, white owners, slave owners, often impregnated their female black slaves because since slaves were property, <laughs> You could increase your property if you had babies who could grow up to be slaves, right? So Alice is like an antebellum South version of Dana, a living reminder of what Dana's life might have been like had she been born in some earlier time. And although she fights what is happening to her, Alice's will is ultimately broken. Meanwhile, we have Dana's husband, Kevin Franklin. Now, Kevin is a relatively progressive white man who married a black woman despite the objections of his family. As a time traveler to the south of the early 19th century, he decides, I'm going to free slaves, okay, and becomes friends with them even. Yet, because slavery does not affect him personally, Kevin is often blind to much of the injustice around him. As a privileged white man of 1976, freeing slaves in 1815 and supporting social justice causes in the 1970s, well, those are liberal-minded projects rather than deeply rooted convictions. So he doesn't have the connection that Dana has with Alice. Now, throughout the book, Butler emphasizes three primary symbols the use of writing as a weapon, maps as a way of creating under, the Underground Railroad, and the exploration of what truly makes a physical location a home. And, and Butler unpacks each of these brilliantly. Now, besides uh, the Gabaldon novels, if you liked uh, Colson Whitehead's novel, The Underground Railroad, uh, then you you'll probably truly embrace Butler's much earlier and equally provocative kindred. Both are very similar in spirit, and Butler did it first. Now, our third writer is the Brooklyn-based author, Nora Keita Jemison, and she publishes under N.K. Jemison. She was born in September uh, of 1972. Besides her work as a writer, she is also a professional psychologist, which I, I think, uh, you know, kind of informs a lot of her work too. Her speculative in, uh, fiction includes a wide range of themes, uh, notably cultural conflict and oppression. Her debut novel, The Thousand Kingdoms, and the subsequent books in the Inheritance Trilogy uh, received universal critical acclaim. The three books of her Broken Earth series made her the first author to win the Hugo Award for Best Novel in three consecutive years, as well as the first to win for all three novels in a trilogy. Uh, Jennison was also recipient of the MacArthur Genius Grant in 2020, also known uh, as the MacArthur Fellowship Award, uh, the same fellowship won by Octavia Butler. Now, here's N.K. Jemison in her own words. I am writing the stories that I wish someone had written for me when I was younger. And even though in my head I'm just telling a story, the power of having someone tell stories that have not been told as much, or in some cases at all, it's important for me to kind of remember just how necessary that is. My name is N.K. Jemison, and I am a speculative fiction writer. 
There's no specific things that feed into the creation of an idea. With the Broken Earth, it was partially me having a conversation at a NASA workshop, partially me having a fascination with pretty rocks. Also, it was in some ways inspired by the fact that at the time that I was doing the story, it was the summer in which Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson, and tanks rolled through the streets of a small American town threatening unarmed protesters. And it felt like Tiananmen Square. I was just kind of processing as I was writing, this is a society that hates us so much that just our voices are treated as a military threat. Sometimes the characters that I need to focus on aren't always the characters that I need to be writing. So I will write the story over from different POVs, sometimes in different voices. Sometimes it's things as simple as me walking down a street on a fall afternoon in New York when the wind is blowing and the light is at just like that right angle and the city seems magical. Once I've got an idea that I feel like has legs, then I start trying to figure out ways in which the story could cohere and come together. What the arc of the plot will be, what the arc of the characters will be. In the case of the city we became, it's both a love letter to New York and yes, in some ways a critical letter of New York. There's a lot of ways in which the city could be better and I'm certainly trying to talk about that. And there's a lot of ways in which the city is reacting to changes kind of imposed on it from within and without, such as gentrification. I'm writing about primarily people. I think of myself as a character-focused writer. And so I may be writing a story about priests who suck dreams out of your head in another planet, or people who can make earthquakes happen, but at the end of the day, these are stories ultimately about people growing and learning and dealing with the world as they are. The Broken Earth is set on a world that isn't Earth, and on this world called The Stillness, the story follows a woman who is a mother, who on page one, her son is murdered and she finds her child dead. Then she goes on a search for the child's father and her other daughter in order to try and figure out what exactly happened. As she does this, the biggest apocalypse of all time has just unfolded and she has to track her family down across a landscape that is full of ash and death and fear. Marginalized people writing about marginalized lives is sometimes perceived as groundbreaking or challenging or threatening because we live in a world in which women and black people are inherently politicized. And so the only way that we can get to the point where our lives are less politicized is to normalize them by just simply doing our best to tell our stories and telling our stories in in interesting ways. And as you see, this uh, little video comes from the MacArthur Foundation, which as I say, as you heard in the Charlie Rose interview, it kind of got nicknamed the Genius Award, <laughs> but it's not its actual name. Now, as you clearly heard, women's issues um, the concerns of the Black Lives Matters movement and the many facets of social injustice, among many themes, form the core of her perspective changing, uh, perception changing work. Now, I've chosen her 2018 collection of short stories called How Long Till Black Future History Month. Um, we've been looking at novels uh, today. I, I thought, how about a short story collection? Um, and I think it's very representative of Jemison's work because it presents a wide variety of her key concerns as a woman, as a black person, and as a writer. And it's all there in one volume. Now, stylistically and philosophically, she owes a great deal to writers like the late great Toni Morrison. Uh, Jemison's writing isn't always easy. It can become dense in a kind of a William Faulknerian way, uh, but uh, the challenge I find is worth it. Now, this collection of short stories transports readers to dozens of new worlds, characters, and possibilities, often taking on important societal issues such as uh, uh, rape, 
pollution, <clears throat> the abuse of power and religion, uh, mediocre educational models, and the fallout from capitalism. For me, uh, there are some standout stories. Uh, in the third story, for example, called Red Dirt Witch, uh, an African-American mother living during segregation times uh, in the 50s and 60s sacrifices her joy and her freedom so that her children will have a chance to succeed. Uh, in the disturbing, very original 11th story called The Evaluators, uh, a group of researchers discovers that people in a distant civilization murder their own children. A security guard who obsesses over a dancing woman he can never logically have is the focus of story number 13 called Elevator Dancer. And a restaurant serving up memories is the center of story 14, Cuisine de Memories, de memories. not de memoirs, but de memories. Stone Hunger, which is the 15th story, finds a city of people at the clutches of a young, angry, and powerful girl capable of causing earthquakes and enacting sweet revenge. It's a very powerful story. You actually heard uh, Jemison mention it in her interview, this story. It's a very powerful uh, narrative and in many ways reminiscent of, perhaps you remember this, uh, the brilliant Twilight Zone episode with Billy Mumy called It's a Good Life, which also deals with an angry young child. You may remember that episode and he doesn't like something, they disappear and all the adults like kowtow to him to avoid disaster. Uh, story is very much an homage uh, and it's called Stone Hunger. Uh, there's a wonderful sardonic humor uh, in On the River, uh, excuse me, On the Banks of the River Lex, um, uh, the 16th story. Uh, in this story, uh, and I love, just, the, li just listen to the premise. I mean, it's so cool. Death mourns the end of the human civilization while he's drinking coffee in Starbucks. <laughs> I love it. Uh, and the final story of the collection uh, is called Sinners, Saints, Dragons, and Haints in the City Beneath the Still Waters. Now, there's a title for you. Um, it's Jemison's homage to the victims of Hurricane Katrina. The story follows Tuki, a New Orleans native and drug dealer, discovering purpose and compassion during a major hurricane. And as you probably know, uh, over 20 years, like almost 20 years later, um, coming up on 20 years later, uh, New Orleans, whole sections of that town are still not recovered. Now, are some stories stronger than others for me? Well, of the, the course, the answer is yes. But what reminds me of the Margaret Atwood interview we saw when she said this. Uh, this is what I'm thinking of uh, when I think about me liking or not liking uh, all the stories. Remember when she said, if everyone likes what you write, you've done something wrong. I just love that line. <laughs> and that brings us back to Octavia Butler, who was spot on when she said that a reader brings as much to a story as the writer does. Now, I might end up liking something that others dislike because of my personal knowledge and my experiences. Now, all of our writers today and all of their books are part of a perspective changing conversation. And what is that conversation? Well, a book is one part, but you and your life, well, you create the second part. And what happens in between the two, that 50-50 meeting of writer and reader creates something altogether new. It's a third thing. It's a, it's a conversation that's partly the book and partly you. That middle ground between you and the book is unique because each reader is a unique individual. And all of that brings me to our fourth writer, Ursula K. Legant who was born in Berkeley, California in 1929 and passed away 
in my new hometown, Portland, Oregon, in 2018. She was best known for uh, her works of fantasy and speculative fiction. She was first published in 1959, and her literary career spanned nearly 60 years, producing more than 20 novels and over 100 short stories, in addition to poetry, literary criticism, translations, and children's books. Simply put, Lagan has been called a major voice in American letters. Now, back in July of 2021, I had the honor to attend an event here in Portland at the Portland Art Museum. There, the United States Post Office unveiled its new forever stamp, featuring a beautiful portrait of Lagan with a scene from her famous novel, The Left Hand of Darkness, which is in the background. The city of Portland was chosen, of course, because it's where Lagan lived for much of her life. I had the pleasure of chatting with Legan's daughter-in-law, Nancy, and I've come to include her as an acquaintance of mine. She's a delightful person. Uh, you can see her there. Uh, it says Nancy in the bottom center of your screen. Uh, Legan's son, Theo, to whom Nancy is married, uh, up there in the upper right, uh, and her granddaughter, India, see her there in the lower right, uh, they were also in attendance with other family, friends, and dignitaries. And it was a really a, a terrific uh, experience, and it kind of connected me in a new way to Lagan, and especially now since I, I know uh, her uh, son um, bar barely, but Nancy. Uh, she's really a, a fine acquaintance that I know through the Portland Art Museum. Uh, it, it makes a different perspective, doesn't it, when you know somebody? So who was this woman? Well, this intriguing six minute video, which includes a couple of comments by our first author, Margaret Atwood, offers a fascinating look into Legan's transformation as a writer. Now, unlike Atwood, Butler and Jemison, Legan did not start out as a writer, particularly focusing on either social or feminist issues. In fact, she talks about that in this interview. I think you'll find this overall interview very revealing. Um, by the way, I've decided against using the closed captioning on this video because it's really, really poor and distracting. But hopefully you'll get the main points. And again, you'll probably have to adjust the sound on your devices. I think it would make sense if I went on and spoke as what I am, a writer, a writer of science fiction. A woman writer of science fiction. You know, I am a very rare creature. My species was at first believed to be mythological, like the Tribble and the Unicorn. In the tombs of Atuan, you've got a, a female central character. And yet she certainly doesn't uh, emerge as a liberated woman. Uh, no, the, the Earthsea books as feminist literature are a total, complete bust from my own archetypes and from my own cultural upbringing. I couldn't go down deep and come up with a woman wizard. Maybe I'll learn to eventually, but when I wrote those, I couldn't do it. I wish I could have. When I started writing, which was in the 1940s, and when I started publishing, which was in the 1960s, the sort of basic assumption about fiction was that men were at the center of it. In fantasy, in science fiction, the heroes were all male. This was taken for granted. And that is true of the, the first trilogy of Earthsea. Even Tombs of Atuan, which is all about women. But look at the women. Our main character is a young girl who was taken from her family as a baby to serve the powers of the tombs. She doesn't remember the name her mother gave her, Tenar. It was taken from her. She was unnamed and renamed Arha, the Eaten One. 
Tin Arm meets Ged in the tombs. He knows what her real name is, and he can give it back to her. And that, in a sense, is what frees her from being that uh, rather dreadful kind of priestess that she had to be. Tanara is supposed to have all this power, but what is her power? Uh, it's her nothing. She, she controls nothing. The world is actually being run by men, as it usually was. You have this really pretty masculine, pretty male-dominated world in the Earth Sea trilogy. Just about everything in it, including the dragons, is male. There's a famous bit in the first book where she mentions in passing that there's a saying as weak as a woman's magic, um, and I think as wicked as a woman's magic, and this is just sort of thrown in there. What I'd been doing as a writer was being a woman pretending to think like a man. I had to think, now why have I put men at the center of the books almost entirely? And the women are either marginal or in some way essentially dependent on their magic. I started to write the fourth book in the series, Tahanu, and it just wouldn't go. And it took me 17 years to figure out why Tenar did that and what her way to go was. And during that time, that gap, a lot of things happened in my life. A lot of things happened in the world, naturally. Along comes the, the revival of feminism in the 70s. But I was not part of it as a movement, partly because as a housewife and mother of three kids at home, I was not behaving the way a proper feminist should. There was a considerable feeling that we needed to cut loose from marriage for men and for motherhood. And there was no way I was going to do that. And it was kind of only as I began getting more confidence in who I was, I began to feel more at home in it as a movement. Of course I can write novels with one hand and bring up three kids with the other. Yeah, sure, you know, watch me. There's a lot of pride and self-respect involved. I can do it, I will do it, by God. The modern feminist movement had just sort of hit science fiction. And some people embraced it, and some people were pretty upset about it. There was a, a big um, argument about, you know, whether there was room for women in science fiction. And they meant as readers, as writers, and as characters. It was almost like taking a cork out of a bottle of champagne that you'd just shaken up. You know, there was a kind of explosion of ideas and opinions that had been bottled up for a while. By the way, I want to state that I think Ernest Hemingway was unjust and full of shit. <laughs> so I kind of had to rethink my entire approach to writing fiction. I learned to read other women's writings. It was important to think about privilege and power and domination in terms of gender, which was something that fantasy had not done. Okay, I'm putting that pause there. And this uh, particular video, as I say, is on my website. If you've had trouble understanding some of it and, and want to re-listen, you can. What I love about that little clip that you saw is her complete honesty about her ever evolving role as a writer. I think it's very uh, refreshing. You know, she admits uh, so many different things in there. Well, the fourth novel that I'd like to look at today, um, it's The Lathe of Heaven. Uh, now, yes, there's The Left Hand of Darkness and any of the Earthsea novels, but the often surrealistic lathe of heaven is certainly a perception-bending experience, and it hits on one of Legan's favorite topics, which is the abuse of power. Published in 1971, the novel is set 30 years later 
in Portland, Oregon uh, in the year 2002. In that future Portland, the city has 3 million inhabitants and suffers from continuous rain. That part has not changed. It's so economically deprived that poor inhabitants suffer from chronic protein deprivation and malnutrition. Meanwhile, there's a massive war in the Middle East and climate change has devastated everyone's quality of life. Well, that part's kind of true too. Well, in the midst of this bleak world, we find a character named George Orr, O-R-R. -R. Um, he's a young man who abuses uh, drugs to prevent himself from dreaming. Well, why does he not want to dream? Well, because once he dreams it, it becomes reality. And after one of his dreams, that new reality is the only reality for everyone else. Only he, George, retains any memory of the previous pre-dream reality. He undergoes, uh, undergoes the threat of incarceration after a drug bust and or undergoes treatment for his addiction. He's forced to take treatment. So George attends therapy sessions with an ambitious psychiatrist and sleep researcher named William Haber. Um, Haber quickly sees, uh, seeks to use George's power to change the planet. Uh, his experiments enhance Orr's abilities, but end up producing a series of increasingly intolerable alternative worlds based on an assortment of utopian and dystopian premises. For, for example, after Haber directs George to dream of a world without racism, the skin of everyone on the planet becomes uniformly light gray. Eliminating overpopulation is disastrous after George dreams about a devastating plague that eliminates most humans. And when George dreams peace on earth, it results in an alien invasion of the moon that unites everybody on earth against the potential threat. Well, each effective dream uh, gives Haber more wealth and status until he is effectively the ruler of the planet. So Haber certainly is misusing the patient, uh, you know, doctor patient uh, position there. So yeah, or his financial uh, position improves some, but he's unhappy with Haber's meddling and just wants to let things be. Increasingly frightened by Haber's lust for power and delusions of divinity, or contacts a lawyer named Heather Lelash uh, to represent him against Haber. He falls in love with Heather, uh, but is unsuccessful in getting released from therapy. The rest of the book describes George's attempts with Heather to make things right once again, or at least better than they were. Now, telling you more than that would spoil a truly engaging story. Huh? Uh, just think of that. If whatever you dreamed actually became reality for everybody else, they wouldn't remember any past experience. Only you remember what the past was like. And that, that's pretty terrifying. Well, the point of the novel and uh, something that Legan touched on in the interview you watch becomes a beautiful segue to our final writer, Mary Shelley. Um, in that novel, uh, in her main novel, the one that we all know, Frankenstein, Shelley explores the very idea that gives Legan uh, the premise for her novel, Lathe of Heaven, which is, if you have the power to change the world and you think you can change it for what you think is the betterment of humanity, do you have a right to do that? Who made you God, <laughs> right? And as I say, that does bring us to our final writer, Mary Shelley, Dr. Frankenstein, and to the doctor's creature. Now, biographically speaking, Shelley was born in 1797, so obviously we're not going to get a live interview. Um, she started writing Frankenstein in the summer of 1816, when she was only 18 years old, and she died in 1851 from a brain tumor at the age of 53. So like Octavia Butler, she 
died far too young. So at this point, I'd like to share with you a short TED talk um, about Shelley and her novel. And it hits upon many of the highlights that you need to know about Shelley's book and about Shelley's life. In 1815, the eruption of Mount Tambora plunged parts of the world into darkness and marked a gloomy period that came to be known as the year without a summer. So when Mary and Percy Shelley arrived at the house of Lord Byron on Lake Geneva, their vacation was mostly spent indoors. For amusement, Byron proposed a challenge to his literary companions. Who could write the most chilling ghost story? This sparked an idea in 18-year-old Mary. Over the next few months, she would craft the story of Frankenstein. Popular depictions may evoke a green and groaning figure, but that's not Mary Shelley's monster. In fact, in the book, Frankenstein refers to the nameless monster's maker, Dr. Victor Frankenstein. So tense is the struggle between creator and creature that the two have merged in our collective imagination. Before you read or reread the original text, there are several other things that are helpful to know about Frankenstein and how it came to assume its multiple meanings. The book traces Dr. Frankenstein's futile quest to impart and sustain life. He constructs his monster part by part from dead matter and electrifies it into conscious being. Upon completing the experiment, however, he's horrified at the result and flees. But time and space aren't enough to banish the abandoned monster, and the plot turns on a chilling chase between the two. Shelley subtitled her fireside ghost story, The Modern Prometheus. That's in reference to the Greek myth of the Titan Prometheus, who stole fire from the gods and gave it to humanity. This gave humanity knowledge and power, but for tampering with the status quo, Prometheus was chained to a rock and eaten by vultures for eternity. Prometheus enjoyed a resurgence in the literature of the Romantic period during the 18th century. Mary was a prominent Romantic and shared the movement's appreciation for nature, emotion, and the purity of art. Two years after Mary released Frankenstein, Percy reimagined the plight of Prometheus in his lyrical drama, Prometheus Unbound. The Romantics used these mythical references to signal the purity of the ancient world in contrast to modernity. They typically regarded science with suspicion, and Frankenstein is one of the first cautionary tales about artificial intelligence. For Shelley, the terror was not supernatural, but born in a lab. In addition, Gothic devices infuse the text. The Gothic genre is characterized by unease, eerie settings, the grotesque, and the fear of oblivion, all elements that can be seen in Frankenstein. But this horror had roots in personal trauma as well. The text is filled with references to Shelley's own circumstances. Born in 1797, Mary was the child of William Godwin and Mary Wollstonecraft. Both were radical intellectual figures, and her mother's book, A Vindication of the Rights of Women, is a key feminist text. Tragically, she died as a result of complications from Mary's birth. Mary was haunted by her mother's death and later experienced her own problems with childbirth. She became pregnant following her elopement with Percy at 16, but the baby died shortly after birth. Out of four more pregnancies, only one of their children survived. Some critics have linked this tragedy to the themes explored in Frankenstein. Shelley depicts birth as both creative and destructive, and the monster becomes a disfigured mirror of the natural cycle of life. The monster, therefore, embodies Dr. Frankenstein's corruption of nature in the quest for glory. This constitutes his fatal flaw, or hamartia. His god complex is most clear in the line, life and death appear to me ideal bounds which I should first break through and pour a torrent of light onto our dark world. Although he accomplishes something awe-inspiring, he has played with fire at his own ethical expense. And that decision echoes throughout the novel, which is full of references to fire and imagery that contrasts light and dark. These moments suggest not only the spark of Prometheus's fire, but the power of radical ideas to expose darker areas of life.
always like these TED Talks. I, you know, they <laughs> are able to squeeze so much into just a few minutes. But before we wrap up today, I'd, I'd like to go a little further. With Mary Shelley, you are confronted with a woman who dared defy the norms of society in real life. As you heard, she ran away with the poet Percy Shelley. He was a married man when she was 16 and he was 24. She had numerous affairs with both men and women. She spoke about religion and politics at a time when it was considered unseemly for a woman to do so. Well, the, the, the list of her provocative actions is absolutely lengthy. But let's develop those thoughts for a moment. Shelley was openly provocative regarding her sexuality at a time that meant being ostracized socially and uh, even being potentially imprisoned. She famously lost her virginity to the poet Percy Shelley on the grave of her mother in St. Pancras's Cemetery in London. Yes, you heard that right. And then proceeded to have numerous affairs with both men and women, several of whom were also the mistresses of her husband, Percy, who had affairs with men and women. And after he died, she proceeded to have an ongoing relationship, possibly sexual, with one of Percy's lovers, Jane Williams. Now on your screen, you see Mary and Percy, and in the center, a quote from Frankenstein spoken by the nameless creature that beautifully summarizes Mary's passionate nature. I have love in me, the likes of which you can scarcely imagine, the rage, the likes of which you would not believe. If I cannot satisfy the one, I will indulge the other. Well, all of this openly scandalous sexual behavior forced Mary Shelley to live away from the prudery of England for many long periods in her life. And on top of her bisexuality, she had to deal with society's animus against women writers. Most of her early writings, including Frankenstein, were published anonymously. And her father-in-law, Percy's father, forbade her from using the Shelley name on any of her work for many, many years. Indeed, despite the fame that she got for the novel and for her subsequent novels like The Last Man, Frankenstein remained officially an anonymous work through the 1831 edition, which you see over on the right. Now, most people knew that it was Mary who had written it, despite the front page still saying by the author of. But that did not stop her detractors. In fact, as the novel Frankenstein grew in popularity, that 1831 edition there, over there on your right, when it was published, a few of her critics said that it was actually Percy Shelley who had written the book because no woman, and especially an 18-year-old woman, could possibly have created such a book. Well, for those of you who have never read Frankenstein, I think you'll be very surprised by how different it is from the various film versions that have been made. As the video informed you, the creature is not some grunting clod. He's a supremely intelligent being who speaks multiple languages and who confronts his creator, Dr. Frankenstein, with brilliant arguments derived from Milton's Paradise Lost, portions of Plutarch's Lives, and Goethe's novel, Sorrows of Young Werther. Now, without giving too much away, the book is written as a series of increasingly deep layers of narration. The first layer is a group of letters that Captain Robert Walton writes to his sister, Margaret Saville, while he is obsessively exploring the Arctic seas in search of the magnetic North Pole. Well, one day, Walton, whose ship is landlocked in the ice, sees a huge creature on a sled heading north with another sled in hot pursuit. That other sled is named, uh, is, I should say manned, uh, by Victor Frankenstein. Frankenstein seeks rest on Walton's ship. That second layer of narration is Dr. Frankenstein telling Captain Walton the story of how he created his nameless creature and the subsequent series of disasters that occur. 
While pursuing his creation, the creature confronts Frankenstein. And this becomes the third layer of the narration. In this layer, the creature tells his story from his point of view, from the time he woke up in Frankenstein's lab to the present moment. And in the middle of the creature's story, he tells of a family named the De Lacy's, whose cottage deep in the forest he observed for an extended period of time. This segment forms the fourth narrative layer of the novel. In it, we hear the exchanges between the creature and the patriarch of the De Lacy family, a man who is blind. Now, because he is blind, the old man has no prejudice against the creature's deformities. As a result, the creature learns to read and speak thanks to the family's large library. Unfortunately, there's a devastating encounter when the other family members return home and the creature is forced to flee. The irony, of course, is delicious. The people who have physical sight are the most blind, and the blind person is the one who can truly see the creature for all his worth. The bitterness and anger. Uh, the creature feels as he wanders through the wilderness is totally understandable. Despite all his attempts to love people and to do good, to be accepted, he's been abandoned by his creator and by everyone else he encounters. Everyone treats him ultimately with disgust and violence. The creature thus becomes one of the first examples in English literature of the anti-hero, uh, the misunderstood antagonist, the sympathetic monster. Well, by the end of the novel, the reader realizes the complexity of the narrative. In an enormous packet of letters written to his sister, Captain Walton recounts Frankenstein's story, which contains the creature's story, which contains the de Lacy's story. It's four solid layers deep of storytelling. It's like a Russian doll. It's quite remarkable. Clearly, the teenage Mary Shelley was a prodigy, and like I've said, no movie version of this brilliant and complex novel has ever done complete justice to it. Well, whew, there you are. Five remarkable women, uh, five remarkable works of perspective-changing fiction. Five works that challenge us through fantasy, science, and history to look at ourselves and our world in a new way. Uh, remember, you can uh, uh, do more exploring at my website, makingwings.net, and that's deeper dive number uh, 33. Well, with that said, uh, now it is time to share your thoughts 